maybe we'd start things off by trying to articulate what that is. You know, what is this conversation about? What is it for? What are we hoping or intending to, uh, to create here? This conversation, I'm hoping, will help people to integrate and understand more deeply, not just what's going on, but maybe how we can talk about it in a way that's going to promote some resolution, some peace. Not that we're going to have that impact on the situation over there, but we'd like to have an impact on how people talk about the situation. And I hope to do so uh, peacefully with respect for all and, um, and very honestly. So that's my intention here. I'd like to show Palestinians that they have some allies. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we speak for all the people who are not Palestinian, but who are horrified by what's going on and just want to show our support and just bear witness to this uh, genocide that's happening. Um, I'd also like to, you know, we're all Jewish. We come from a Jewish background. You know, Dad, you survived the Holocaust. And not that that gives us any special authority to talk on, on the issue, but um, for Jewish people especially, sometimes they're more open to hearing perspectives from from Jews that they don't that they wouldn't hear from somebody else. So perhaps we can maybe reach some Jewish people today who uh, are struggling with this, have some questions. Maybe we can reach them. Yeah, I'm with both of those. There's a real rift in the Jewish community right now. It's a, a deep fault line has opened up and it's very wrenching for everybody on all sides of it. And obviously the three of us have strong feelings about which side we want to be on. Um, but I do have Jews contacting me in my uh, DMs and in other ways. Now, some of them just come with abuse and vitriol and hostility. But many of them under the surface of that, or even outright, I sense that they're asking a question. There's a kind of anguish. And they want to know how can we see it the way we see it and how can we be saying the things we're saying. Like us. Us, yes. the three of us. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And people like us. And there's more and more people like us. Yeah. So if we can leave people with more clarity, at least of where we're coming from, and then hopefully open them to opening their ears to where Palestinians are coming from and everyone else affected is coming from, um, I, I think that'll be time well spent. I was born into the, to the genocide, spent my first year as an infant in Hungary under Nazi occupation. And um, in Hungary, I did um, experience anti-Semitism. I mean, these days when people talk about how afraid they are of anti-Semitism, let me tell you, I know from anti-Semitism. I, I had changed classes in school because of being bullied as a Jew. My brother and I were at one point set up on neighborhood so-called friends for being Jewish. And uh, I did grow up with the sense that there's something wrong with being Jewish. I mean, we had the Jewish holidays, which I loved, but at the same time, there was something to hide. Not so much there's something wrong, but something to hide. Until I became a Zionist in my uh, teenage years here in Canada. And uh, that really was a liberating experience because all of a sudden there was nothing to hide. In fact, there was something to be proud of. And there was a whole, whole history and a whole people and a vigorous new state, uh, uh, one that had power to defend its people, to identify with. And um, for years, I read nothing but Jewish histories and uh, Zionist histories and so on. So, I mean, when people now say to me, you don't know the history, you don't, you, know, you don't know our point of view. Yes, I do. I could spot it in my sleep, you know, because that's, that's what I did for years. And I was the local leader of a Zionist um, youth movement here. And then what happened for me is the Vietnam War happened. And when Vietnam War happened, a lot of illusions bit the dust about the nature of this particular society. In North American society, particularly U.S., that was quite capable of massacring millions of Asians and the press that would lie about it daily. And there was a whole anti-war movement then, which I was a university student I became a part of. And, and, and then you start asking, questioning everything. Not just what's going on over there in Vietnam, but who would do such things yeah. and what kind of media would support it and, and, and suppress the truth about it until eventually the truth comes out. So by the time this 1967 war came along, I was in a very questioning mode. 
I began to look at the history. And the first book I read, and this is what people don't realize, this is not retrospective. Once you start looking at Zionist history, you find out that there were people right from the beginning that were questioning its premises. Which we can talk about later. Yeah. But to complete this story, then in um, there was a book written by uh, in 1975 by an Israeli. Uh, his name was Simha Flapan. And Flapan was a member of the Mapam Party, which is a progressive labor party in Israel, later joined the Labor Party. He was, he fought in the 1948 war. So he had earned his spurs, you might say. Mm -hmm. And he was a lifelong kibbutz member. But he just was the first one from within to show that everything I've been told um, that had buttressed my Zionist perspective about how the state was created and how the state has behaved since its creation was mythology. And since then, I've read many more Israeli historians and I've followed the news myself, I've been to the occupied territory. So I've now long ago come to the conclusion that um, no matter how satisfying it seems to our historical trauma to have this antidote that actually in that endeavor to salve our own wounds, a tremendous injustice, historical injustice has been committed against another people. Mm -hmm. We can talk about the details of it later, but the point is we try to escape from our own nightmare by imposing a nightmare on another people, and we're still doing it. Yeah. So that's that's the long and short of it. Yeah. I mean, before I forget, I'll touch on it later, but I would add the salve has been, um, the, the so-called salve, the balm, has become an intensifier and amplification of our own wound. Yeah. And we're doing it to ourselves too. Well, obviously my path is very influenced by dad's, um, you know, a few memories stand out. I came home from Sunday school yeah. one year, I must have been. Hebrew school? So, yeah, like Hebrew Sunday school. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. Hey, remember we went to Sunday school? We did Sunday school. In preparation for our bar mitzvah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, I told you about what I'd learned that day about Israeli history, and you told me I never have to go back there again because it was all propaganda. Uh -huh. um, and then the memories, you know, during the first intifada, you went there uh, to witness, to bear witness to the crackdown in the West Bank. And Gaza. Hey, you went to Gaza too. Okay, yeah. So I remember I heard you on the radio and I heard you uh, break down in tears. Yeah. Um, and that was a very powerful moment for me. And then I remember that one time you were invited to a debate with the uh, on on the lo on local television. Yeah. A few blocks from here. With with other you know uh, members of the Jewish community. Yeah. And they all refused to debate you. Yeah. Uh, like yeah. They wouldn't appear if you were allowed on the That's stage. Right. So I you remember... warned CBC that that was going to happen. Yeah. And yeah. they said, "Don't worry, we'll handle it." Yeah. And then two days before the debate, they're like, "Sorry, Doctor Matze, we can't." <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah this, is, this is this is the talk about cancel culture. You know, <laughs> it's the original cancel culture. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but I remember, you know, I drew a lesson from that. Like, uh, <clears throat> under what circumstance would you be so uh, opposed to even debating someone? It's probably if you can't defend your position. And um, and then I remember, you know, I was fourteen when the Oslo so-called peace process began. That yeah. would have been the fall of ninety. Three, yeah, right. Fall of May, fall of May three, yeah. yeah. And I remember on television there was such hope and optimism, and I even wanted to. I started feeling that hope and optimism. Yeah. But I remember you warning at the time that uh, this was not that this may not be what it appears to be. Yeah. And I, you know, I drew for and, and then reading then Chomsky and, and Edward Said and Edward yeah. Said warned from the start that this was a Palestinine betrayal that That's right. Palestinians were simply now acting as collaborators in their own occupation, the Palestinian Authority. Um, you know, I understood then that, you know, the way our political system works is so often people's best intentions are manipulated and taken advantage of. So who wouldn't want peace in the Middle East now? But the people in power are so cynical that they'll take something as, you know, celebratory as a peace agreement and turn that into just another uh, tool for occupation. Right. So that was a powerful moment for me. And then so we went to a, a socialist a Zionist summer camp growing yeah. up. And so at the summer camp, I made some of the, my best friends in the world. And I also understood there how it kind of works, where 
all these wonderful memories and friendships are created. And then that is sort of conflated with the state of Israel. And that's how North American Jews are enlisted in supporting the state by virtue of their, not just their familial bonds and the memory of the Holocaust, but also their friends, yeah. their memories, you know? I mean, obviously my journey parallels Aaron's. I, I preceded him by a few years. I also remember that radio interview with you, with you weeping. I don't think I'd ever seen you cry, but I was hearing you cry on national radio. It was very striking. I remember the hate mail that would come to our home. I remember yeah. one in particular scrawled from some uh, Jewish Holocaust survivor in Halifax, I believe, that said, may your Arab friends devour your filthy carcass. You're worse than the Kapos in Auschwitz. At least they betrayed their own to save their own skins. Yeah. Chief. And no, like, no, that, like, that, that was a li light moment. Yeah, it was, well, it was a lovely time. <laughs> uh, you know, I was 13 or whatever. And, and um, I'm like Aaron, I remember thinking, what kind of position must you have if that's your reply? Yeah. You know, how contorted must you be in your mind, heart, and soul yeah. that that's your way of communicating your disagreement? Yeah. Yeah. And I never saw you do, I mean, I saw you blow up sometimes. I saw your rage. As I said to you at your birthday, Obviously, there were things about your anger that could scare me as a kid, but when it came to this topic, yeah. there was a grounded righteousness in values that felt right to me. Yeah. And um, so I was sort of in awe of it, mm. and I was looking for my own relationship to the thing. And then I remember, I mean, summer camp was a huge thing, going to Camp Miriam, you know, um, given, and I know that it was a, you know, it ran in our family, that we were sort of, our family was, uh, in, you know, a, a big name at that camp, uh, my uncles included, but... In any case, it was my favorite place in the world. It was, yeah. uh, you know, I I got along much better with my peers there than at school. Yeah. Um, and the Jewish aspect of it was a really strong part of that. Yeah. And the Zionist aspect of that was a big part of the Jewish aspect. Yeah. We were learning a form of Jewish identity that filled in a blank for all of us, which is the void at the center of North American Judaism yeah. post World War II. You know, Hitler didn't succeed in wiping out the Jews, but a big chasm was left at the heart of Jewish identity. Yiddish was wiped out. Yeah. Um, we won't even talk about the, well, because we're not Mizrahi, but there's a whole other story to tell yeah. about the plight of the Jews of the East, of the Middle East. So summer camp provided a sexy, fun, playful, musical, irreverent, all ages space to be myself. Yeah. And the big flag at the center of that was the Israeli one next to the Canadian one. Yeah. And um, we had Israeli madrachim counselors yeah. who were all, they all had a particular quirky kind of charisma. Now, some of them I liked more than others. And I always, from a, from a young age, felt a certain kind of manipulation coming from them. Hmm. I always felt like they were being paraded in front of us as a kind of the trying to recruit you paragon of something to try to recruit and, and explicitly yeah. they were and I later yeah. became a counselor and they, we would we would only half joke about how we were you know propagandizing kids into yeah. you know Zionist brainwashing yeah uh, so sort of semi ironically yeah um, but and I was and of course I was influenced by you so at camp I would argue with my Israeli counselors and I would argue with my fellow. Uh, campmates and I would make my campmates cry with my, you know, my rants about Palestinian rights or whatever, but I was still ensconced within that. Yeah. And then I spent a year in Israel. I was on kibbutz when Oslo happened. I remember calling you and I don't remember you saying this might not be what it seems. I remember you saying, don't believe a word of it. It's, 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 it's paper thin. It's not what it seems. Yeah. And that was really deflating to me because that was sort of, but you know, if the Oslo Accords, if if Yasser Arafat shaking hands with Yitzhak Rabin on the, yeah. the on the lawn of the White House isn't cause for hope, then what is? Yeah. If that's true, then the problem must go so much deeper than I thought, and mm -hmm. so much deeper than anyone around me is willing to admit. Easy for me. Yeah, the myth of the generous Israeli peace offer. Mm -hmm. Talk about that. Well, if you read any. Or, so many op-eds written about Palestine for the last 20 years start with the premise that it's the Palestinians' fault that they've rejected Israel's outstretched hand of peace. What was Abba Eben's quote? The Palestinians. The Palestinians never missed an opportunity to miss an opportunity. Yeah. Abba Eben, a famous Israeli diplomat. Back in the 70s. Yeah, coin mentioned. The Palestinians never miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity. Yeah. And it's projection because Israel, from its founding, has always rejected any peaceful outcome. It's um, always chosen expansion over security. That's Chomsky's term. And particularly, the 
the myth that Israel offered a full Palestinian state to Arafat and his successors, but they all walked away because they cared more about, you know, destroying the Jewish state than having their own Palestinian state. Mm -hmm. It is a complete myth. Uh, and it's been refuted so many times. There's so much documentation for it. The so-called generous offer at Camp David in July 2000 by Hud Barak to Arafat uh, wanted to keep all the major West Bank settlement blocks, um, wanted to have a land swap in which Israel took nine times more uh, land than Palestine would get. So a nine to one ratio, or maybe an eight to one ratio, something like that. And then subsequent offers were, subsequent discussions, Israel slightly modified its stance a little bit, but still never fundamentally was willing to recognize um, the right of Palestinians to live in freedom in a contiguous state. Uh, contiguous meaning land actually connecting. Yeah, it's not surrounded by these huge settlements. Yeah. Uh, the right of Palestinians to return. We never want to recognize the right of return. Which is a thread in international law. Yeah, and Palestinian nego negotiators on all these issues were, really, were willing to compromise uh, because Arafat and his successors wanted nothing more than to make a deal. But they were never offered an opportunity that gave them their minimal rights. Yeah. And uh, that myth that they walked away from a generous offer, offer is being used so many times to justify violence against them. Because to be able to sustain this narrative where we only have the alternative to use force, um, you have to present your victim as stubborn, um, obstinate. Like they, you know, you, they will not make peace with you. They refuse all peaceful accommodation. So we have no choice. We don't want to commit violence, but we have to. I mean, what's the goal of my airline? Uh, we can forgive the Arabs for killing our children, but we can never forgive them for making us kill theirs. Yeah, which right. was echoed just the other day by this Israeli so-called psychotherapist who said something like, we we fight out of love. Yeah. You know, they yeah. fight out of hate. Yeah. One fact you wish people understood. It didn't begin with October the 7th. It began a good 130 years before then. And it began with an impossible ambition, which is to create a Jewish homeland in a country that was where there was already a thriving population, and that we could do this somehow bloodlessly and, and cleanly and morally. If you want to move towards peace, you have to deal with what creates the conditions for peace and what undermines it. And what I'm saying, it goes back a long time when the decision was made and pursued relentlessly to create a Jewish majority and, in fact, totally, totally Jewish country in the sense of control in a land where there was already a population. This is not retrospective. Ben-Gurion, the first, president, first prime minister of Israel, said in the 1930s that, politically speaking, we are the aggressors and the Arabs are just defending their homeland. That's what Ben Green said. Now, publicly, they spoke a different language. But Ben Green said this very clearly to his fellow Zionists. His political rival, Jabotinsky, who founded the party that later became today's Likud party. Which is Netanyahu's party. Which is Netanyahu's party. He said that the Jewish colonial project, he called it that, the Jewish colonial project, cannot be achieved without force because no country, no people give up the land without fighting for it. So what I want people to know in a nutshell is there's antecedents, there's a history behind this, and the history is that of one people coming into a land and having the resources, having the imperial support to achieve their goals at the expense of displacing and oppressing and occupying and suppressing and very frequently mass killing than other people. But you may think it's justified. You may think the Jews had so such a need to have a state that anything goes. Well, that's fine if you believe that. I can't argue with you, except you want the result. The result is what's going on right now. You know, there's this great expression in Hungarian that you 
taught me or taught us, which yeah. is when something is so false that not even the opposite is true. Yeah. I use that all the time. Yeah. The notion that Zionism, well, I think it's pretty easy to dispel with the notion that Zionism is Judaism, right? Yeah. Just look at us. Yeah. Unless you want to look me in the face and tell me I'm not Jewish because I believe what I believe. And there are people who want to go there, but I think that's a pretty desperate and transparent play, mm -hmm. kind of a foul, like, you know, five minutes for conflation. Um, it's a hockey reference. Well, you could, of course, be a self-hating Jew. Well, that's, that's the, then they go to the psychological Freudian explanation. Yeah. You know, that's fine. Doctor, if you want to put me on the couch and diagnose me with something, we can, two can play that game. We're seeing it right now in the Jewish community. We're feeling it all around us. Let's actually try to turn to it, turn our eyes to it with some love, some truth, some clarity, some compassion, but some rigor. What do we say about where Jews are at right now and how the current moment is an expression and amplification of, and certainly um, a crisis and hopefully an inflection point for Jewish historical trauma? Well, one of the impacts of the current events is that this fault line that's been developing inside the Jewish community for quite some time is now just cracked wide open. Wide open, yeah. Where you have... Um, especially on generational lines, but not completely. We have a lot of Jews now who are utterly appalled at what's going on. Yeah. And uh, then is the mainstream um, institutions that continue to really vociferously support, justify, um, ten past ten kids losing their legs every day and everything else that's going on. So where is that coming from? From a perspective of trauma, there's such a thing as individual trauma, then there's collective trauma. And this collective trauma lives in the memory of the collective. But it seems to function just like individual trauma does. Now, one of the impacts of trauma, there was an interesting article in the New York Times reporting on this, mind you, it was in, in November of last year. Mind you, that was already not news in the trauma world, but Every once in a while, the New York Times discovers uh, the wheel, you know. So they, <laughs> so they, uh, so they had this article about how showing that in the brain, when traumatic memories take over, the rational parts of the brain go offline. You can show this on brain scans. Now, and people go into a state of fear and aggression, flight or fight, and traumas that happened long ago seem like they're happening now so that the present becomes the past and the past becomes the present. I've written about this extensively. I've experienced it personally. You guys have seen me experience it where something in the present sets me off and it's like not in the present, but I'm reacting to an, an old event. Now, when you look at Jewish culture with all the beautiful and many things about it, many things admirable and, and, and um, unique about it. But along with all that, there's always a sense of insecurity and a sense of uh, fear. If you go to the major Jewish holidays that have a story associated with it, I'm not talking about the spiritual holidays like Rosh Hashanah or Yom Kippur, which have no uh, historical narrative attached to it. But the holidays, like the holidays like Hanukkah or Passover or uh, Tisha B'Av. Yeah. Or um, Purim. Purim. Yeah. There's always the story. And the story always is that in every generation that rise up against us, they want to kill us. And those are the stories that we tell our kids around the, on the table. It's true. Four times a year. Mm -hmm. You know, now we managed to triumph, but the warning is, in every generation, they're going to rise up against us. Yeah, yeah. And so, when something like October the 7th happens, which by any account was a horrific event, if you actually are ahistorical, as the Israeli historian Ilan Papi calls it, ahistorical. Ahistorical. Meaning? If you don't know what happened in Palestine, if you don't know then October 7th seems just like yet another pogrom of the worst sort. 
And the line is, this is the worst massacre of Jews since the Holocaust. Yeah. Right. As if, as if October 7th, had so, the, the killings happened because these were Jews. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and whereas, you know, as somebody said, if dinosaurs had occupied and, or Germans or Vikings, Vikings, they, the Palestinians would still be fighting against them. Yeah. No, they're not fighting because they were the fighting against Jews. But the point is that with an ahistorical perspective, if you haven't, if you grew up with the mainstream view of what's happened in Palestine, and we're the victims, we're trying to make peace, they're always attacking us. Then October 7th is just another revivication of that old traumatic wound. And then where are you going to react from? The defensive parts of your brain. And you're going to be in fear mode, and you're going to be in aggressive mode. In fact, you're going to be both of them at the same time. Yeah. And so I get these messages, you know, um, somebody writes on my website, uh, have you dissociated so deeply that you're numb to your own people's genocide? Have you converted to Islam? Or are you a martyr? When you're in that traumatized state, you can't think of any alternatives. Yep. And you can't think of any kind of a rational response. Apart from the genuine pain that people have about people having been killed on October the 7th or relatives abducted or a country they love being attacked. I mean, apart from the, just, you know, those are normal human responses of pain and rage in response to that. But there's also this um, re-wounding of the trauma. I mean, it happens, you're not thinking rationally. And so that anybody even criticizes Israel or points out that there's another story, now we become uh, t terrorist supporters, and we, we, obviously we're Hamas spokespeople, and and because there's such a thing called integrative thinking. In integrative thinking, you can hold two opposing ideas or two contradictory ideas at the same time, which is that Jews have suffered, and there's Palestinian suffering, and maybe there's a way to understand that. But in this world, there's only our suffering. And their suffering is purely self-created. And we can't help but make them suffer because they're making us do it. Right. So it's a trauma response. I mean, apart from being a political response and a colonial response and, and you know, a dominating response on the part of the Israeli government, on the part of individual Jews and communities, there's a lot of unresolved trauma in it. It occurs to me that another binary that the non-integrative mind can't hold is our suffering and our responsibility, yeah, our victimhood, yeah, and our accountability, yeah, right, our agency, yeah, um, and uh, there's a strong, uh, <clears throat> almost a magnetic repulsion against any suggestion that Israel might have something to do with, and our support for it might have something to do with oh, was how we got here. Yeah, Aaron, I, how about you? I also think there's the summer camp factor. You know, you, you know, for in our case, growing up in a summer camp where we associate all these wonderful memories, yes. feelings, uh, experiences uh, with being Jewish and being connected to Israel, something like this happens. You know, the experience of going through that, especially as your brain is developing, it's going to set up a contradiction, and you're going to be, you know, conflicted between, I think, your deepest conscience, but also what you've been conditioned to believe and how you then associate the parts about yourself and your life that you love with, you know, your friends and memories from wonderful experiences like going to a Zionist summer camp and for birthright or birthright or, yeah. or whatever it is. I was speaking to someone here in Vancouver last night who is a straight down the middle of the road, Vancouver mainstream Jewish community member in good standing hmm. who is broken inside by what's happening hmm. and by their, I won't reveal who they are or their gender or anything like that yeah. by their, um, sudden or finally blooming awareness that something is deeply, deeply wrong, not just with Israel or Zionism, but with the Jewish community here that reflexively and dogmatically and desperately supports it. Yeah. And one of the main concerns about speaking out is the implications it will have for this person's relationship with their parents mm. and the re very real possibility that the parents will want to have nothing to do with them mm -hmm. and thus nothing to do with their own grandchildren. Yeah. That is intense, and that is a whole other order of collective trauma. But you guys have, you've lost friends, haven't you, over this? 
I think I weeded out those people a long time ago. Yeah. There, there's some friends who probably are keeping their distance, keeping their distance, but yeah, you know, the younger generation though seems, yeah, it, it's not like it used to be now. It's, it's not cool anymore to be pro-Israel. I mean, and I, I was thinking about, I was wondering why that is. I mean, you know, it's very often that the younger generation is always more progressive, more yeah. open-minded, but I also wonder for younger people, you know, given that opportunities are not what they used to be, uh, economic prospects are more bleak and and given how embedded Israel is into the power structure i wonder if the it's easier to turn away from israel because younger people just don't see anymore the buy in to the power structure the previous generations have had what's it going to get me yeah, if, I, exactly. if i buy in yeah. yeah and so it's easier then to mm. to be open minded and to not accept the shackles that were given in order to advance what about Hamas? What about their genocidal rhetoric against Jews? Let me try to steel man the argument. Let me try to, you know, give it its due before we yeah. do what we're going to do to it. Um, Hamas is a genocidal Islamic fundamentalist organization akin to ISIS, which is bent on global jihad. And the defini definition of jihad, according to these people, is, um, you know, genocidal wiping out of all of Western culture. It's a battle of civilizations. They are... Uh, virulently anti-Semitic, and they will not rest until every single Jew, including the three of us, uh, is wiped off the planet. And when they come for us, they will not spare us, because just because we're anti-Zionists. And that the diabolical, deliberate, systemic, widespread nature of their crimes, or alleged crimes, uh, although for these people it's not an allegation, it's a statement of truth. Well, there were crimes. There, of course there were, but I'm talking about the entire litany of them, Got every it. single yes. detail, which I don't think we want to get into here, no. but it is relevant to touch on, we have to touch on it, um, that the 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 unprecedented and, and uh, unimaginably depraved nature of these crimes uh, sort of obviates any question of proportional response. What's Israel supposed to do? Self-defense, all this other stuff. Um, we can't get into all the details of the background, but this question of who were these people who did this thing and what should be the response to a group like this uh, is the one that we're constantly being told in private and in the media and hearing from uh, Jewish leaders and Israeli leaders and American politicians and politicians all over the world. So let's deal with it. What uh, Maybe we'll start with you, Aaron. Well... My opinion, I'm speaking for myself, it's none of our business. No one says, uh, what about Netanyahu or what about Joe Biden uh, as a condition of granting their citizen basic rights? They're non-citizens. Well, yeah, yeah, but, you know, and so um, it's not, it's, that's Palestinians' business. Yeah. Who, who rules them. And um, now, in terms of the actual details of Hamas, I mean... But it's certain to have, but... It's the past and business, but you can't have an opinion because, like, Joe Biden, you're not American, but you have an opinion on Joe Biden. Right, but no one asked that. I mean, the question, what about, like, what else is Israel supposed to do? Um, that the question implies that um, Palestinians' rights are conditioned upon whether we accept their leaders or not. And uh, it's not our business, it's their business, especially because it's their land that was stolen. And you know, the question of what was Israel supposed to do, it presupposes that Israel has the right to self-defense against land that it occupies. And, you know, I'm not a legal scholar, but there are plenty of legal scholars who make the argument based on international law that occupying powers don't have self-defense rights. Can you quickly dispense with the notion that Israel withdrew from Gaza in 2005? Israel, at a certain point, realized it was really, it wasn't worth it to maintain a few thousand settlers inside Gaza, when really the land they really covet is in the West Bank. That's where precious water reserves are. Uh, it's much more important to the Israeli government to hold on to the West Bank. And so as an Israeli advisor to then President Ali Sharon explained, the disengagement from Gaza was really formaldehyde to freeze the peace process and to stop the demands for a Palestinian state. That was the term used, formaldehyde. This is Dove Wiseglass who called the disengagement from Gaza formaldehyde. And so that was the goal. And then in practice, yes, there were no longer Israeli soldiers and settlers inside Gaza, but Israel still controlled 
everything that came in and out, and it can attack Gaza whenever it wants. So that is what's described as effective control, uh, uh, effective occupation, even even if even if inside the prison the warden is not there, which is the legal equivalent. Yeah, if they're standing outside the prison, they control everything that comes in and out, and they cut off things like chocolate and sweets and every basic good you could imagine if they have a policy of calculating the amount of calories that Palis the average Palestinian in Gaza can have without a full-blown starvation crisis, but they can still have the power to put Palestinians in Gaza on a diet, which also was the term of Doug Wiseglass, an advisor to Sharon. That's an occupying power. And so occupiers don't have rights, they have obligations. And so accordingly, they don't have the right to fire a single bullet into Gaza. They had the right to self-defense on October 7th. Within Israel. Within Israel, as Hamas, of course, you know, um, you know, just because Israel is an occupier doesn't mean they have to let Hamas kill their people. Okay, fair enough. But it's not October 7th anymore. Uh, we're now more than, as we're recording this, more than three months later. And what Israel is doing has nothing to do with self-defense. It's just the latest phase of its decades-old project to wipe out Palestinian self-determination. But the argument would be that uh, the Allies, uh, the, the the Americans, the British, the French, the Russians, and the other side, they didn't stop at the borders of Germany. Once they've expelled Germans from the from the countries they occupied, they went in there to destroy that murderous regime, mm -hmm. and they had to. Right. So this is the argument that Israel would make: is that fine, we protected ourselves on October the seventh, um, but now no, we have to go in there and get rid of these murderers so they don't do it again. Okay, but you cannot possibly draw a comparison between the Nazis, which is a hegemonic exterminationist state, and Hamas, which was founded in response to an occupation. It only was yeah. founded in the late 80s. It was founded in refugee camps. Yeah. Its founders, if you look at their family histories, it's really instructive. All the founders of Hamas have family histories that tie into the Nakba and the, and the, the massacres and the expulsions. Right. Well, you, 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 you know what? In 1956, the Israeli army massacred some men and uh, boys in uh, in Gaza mm -hmm. when it occupied. Israel attacked Egypt, as you know, and Egypt was in control of Gaza Strip at that time. And Israel occupied the Gaza, and um, they killed, they they, they massacred um, hundreds of Arab uh, Palestinian men and boys unarmed. They called them out of their houses, so they killed them, and bodies were in the streets for days because of a curse due, they couldn't even bury the bodies. Mm. An eight-year-old boy watched his uncle being killed. He became one of the funders of Hamas. There we go. Later Isn't that the, right around the time that Moshe Dayan added at the funeral of an Israeli soldier? That who, I, who I wanted killed. to read that quote. Yeah. So yeah. Moshe Dayan, a famed Israeli military leader, yeah. he speaking at a funeral in 1956 for uh, a soldier who was killed by, by Palestinians uh, from Gaza. And he said this, let us not cast the blame on the murderers today why should we deplore their burning hatred for us? For eight years, they have been sitting in the refugee camps in Gaza, and before their eyes, we have been transforming the lands and villages where they and their fathers dwelt into our estate. And he goes on with more. And he wasn't saying this to sympathize with the Palestinians of Gaza. The, the thrust of his message is, given that they are responding to us stealing their land, we have to respond with even more force we, we should not be intimidated because these are determined people. But at least we're not going to cry victim. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I mean, and, and the, the word that cries out to me in that uh, quote is for the last eight years. Yeah. That was 1956. Yeah. The last eight years. Yeah. Now, fast forward to the year 2024. And we're almost and at 80 years. We're almost at 80 years. Yeah. In 2005, there was a study in World, World Journal of Psychiatry, some journal like that. 2005, mind you. 2005. This yeah. is before Hamas gained power in uh, Gaza. Um, and uh, they looked at the war traumatized populations around the world. They said the more, the were most traumatized children in, in the world were in Gaza. This is 2005. And in 2004, Giora Island said, called it a big concentration camp. And who was Giora Island? Uh, one of the heads of Israeli security. Yeah. Okay. Now, so those kids that were studied uh, were adolescents or young kids in 2005. Guess who those young people were that streamed into Israel on October the 7th? Again, we're not just a funny thing. 
but these but but those those Hamas fighters that moved into Israel on October the seventh, most of them went knowing that they're gonna die. And they had never left. You know. They had never left. They had, they had never been outside. No, they were not allowed to leave. You know, that's the so, point. So they were so the point is they were traumatized kids in two thousand five. Then they grew up in this place that I know concentration camp is a three hour word for a lot of people because you, we're not talking about death camps. We're talking about concentration camps where the Nazis would hold their prisoners. Well, and many they, other countries have held. You know, it's not, you know, not, concentration camp is not a Nazi phenomenon. Yeah. yeah. So they they were traumatized already in 2005. The last, they, they lived the next 18 years in this, what's been called the world's largest concentration camp by Israelis. What drives them to that level of desperation, despair, and willing to die and willing to kill? Um, it, it it wasn't self-generated, and then people try to explain this that this is jihad, this is the Muslim hatred for, um, for the non-Muslim, or specifically the jihadist hatred for the Jews. They teach their children to hate. They teach their children in their mother's hate. milk. Well, these are the people that did it, and that, let's remind ourselves. There was no Hamas 40 years ago. And who encouraged their growth? And uh, not to mention then, if you look at the history of it, all the ways that history encour Israel encouraged, as I already quoted, very deliberately the growth and, and Hamas as a counterweight to the secular PLO. Secular moderate PLO. So that they wouldn't have to have peace agreements because now there's nobody to negotiate with. You know, So that's, again, with a... Even if you keep saying this, even without, without justifying anything, these people didn't go out of trees. Yeah. They didn't spring out of the ground yeah. all of a sudden. Yeah. They, they, they're not the spawn of some kind of miserable Jewish, uh, anti Jewish hatred. They came out of a history. But put yourself in that situation, in their situation. If that state represented for you your expulsion from your homeland, the deprivation of your goods, the refusal of letting you go back, your incarceration in a small piece of the earth from where you're not even allowed to leave, constant bombardments, multiple times when your airplanes come and bomb us and kill our children, thousands of them over the years. This is not a new phenomenon. And if this is what the Jews are, and this is what it's done in the name of the Jews, by the Jewish state, with the Jewish star flagging on flying the on Jewish flag. star on the flag and on the tanks. If when you demonstrate peacefully, they still kill you, as as, as they did in 2018, as they did in 2019. If as the Israeli newspaper Hamas, uh, Haaretz, sorry, uh, Hamas, ha Haaretz um, reported your snipers have a contest as to who can shatter more Palestinian knees of people who are demonstrating peacefully. And if this is all being done in the name of the Jews, I'm putting that in quotation marks, and if most of the Jewish organizations around the world support this and justify this, how are you supposed to feel about the Jews and the Jewish state, might you perhaps harbor a lot of hatred? Might you have thoughts of revenge? Might you? I mean, what I'm talking about again, not to agree or to justify any particular action, but can we just for one second put ourselves into the subjective experience of the other and try to understand even if they come to certain positions that are unacceptable, how did they get there? How did they get there? And then there's a more difficult question is, not only how did they get there, but what has been on role? What has been our role that they should get there? And again, this is where if you're ahistorical, if you don't know the history, if you haven't studied it, if you just accepted what the mainstream has told you, if you have swallowed all the perspectives that the mainstream media 
we can talk about the media in a minute, That's right. has uh, fed you, you're not going to know. You're not going to understand these other people. And then all you can have is your age-old fear that here they are coming after us again. Well, I don't see it that way. And I think there's a way out. But it does take some integrative thinking, and it does take some capacity to put yourself in the situation of the other. Now, let me just tell you one story. This is from the New York Times, which every five years will have an article on what it's like to be a Palestinian under Israeli occupation. Every day they'll have an article about what it's like to be an Israeli. Every once in a while they'll have an article, Miracle of Miracles. Um, and this article, published in December, is described by the West Bank, not in Gaza. Let's not forget, Gaza or West Bank is not ruled by Hamas. West Bank is ruled by a cooperating, collaborationist, um, corrupt, quizzling, quizzling Palestinian authority. In the West Bank, the settlers threaten the Palestinians all the time. The settlers are, of course, armed. Palestinians can't be. In this particular article, the New York Times reporter describes how settlers go and threaten a Palestinian village, saying, we're going to come here and we're going to hurt you. So the Palestinians leave. And after a few nights, hoping the riot is over, they come back. Their homes have been this damaged, some destroyed or severely damaged. Their roofs have caved in. It's winter time. The Palestinians come back, the villagers come back. They're meet, met by an Israeli official, representative of the occupation, who says to them, you can come back, but you can't rebuild without a permit. You can't even replace one brick that has been moved. You can't put a tarpaulin over your living room in case it rains, because that would be construction without a license, without a permit. First, you have to get a permit. Now, of course, we all know it's going to take them months to get a permit, if they even get one. Meanwhile, they have to sit in their living rooms with their winter rain falling in, and they can't put a tarpaulin on because that's against the rules of the occupation. Needless to say, no such rules apply to the settlers. Now, people... If that's the only story you knew, if you knew nothing else but that a Palestinian can't put a tarp over his living room that has been destroyed by settlers, because if he does, the army will come and bulldoze their homes for building without a permit. Isn't that enough for you to know what's going on? Yeah. That's all you need to know. And of course, there's so much more. It's all you need to know to want to know more and That's to right. not necessarily double down on what you already think you know. And yet for all that, again, underneath the lies, there are bigger lies. And underneath the bigger lies, there's the biggest lie. And the biggest lie is that there is a, a Jewish-Palestinian conflict. Because guess what? For all of that, Palestinians don't hate Jews. Most Palestinians don't hate Jews, or at least many Palestinians don't hate Jews, which is some kind of miracle. The more Palestinians I meet and speak to, and I'm embraced by, and I'm thanked by in ways that are you know, humbling and to me a little embarrassing because it shouldn't be so extraordinary for a Jewish person to speak up like this, but what people tell me over and over again is my grandmother, who was expelled from her home in 1948, taught me that it's not the Jews, it's the Zionists, it's not the Jews, it's the Israelis. You've both been to the occupied territories, you've been to the West Bank, you've been to Gaza. Were you ever greeted with irrational hatred of you because you're Jewish? Yes, by Israeli soldiers. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying. We were greeted with such warmth to the point yeah. where it's so embarrassing because um, your hosts have so much more at least in my own experience, so much more generosity and humanity than I have. And, yeah, and this is the deep, vicious... They're very gentle people, actually. Yeah, this is the vicious lie 
that is so corrosive to the to to the minds and hearts and souls of those who believe it and repeat it mindlessly without ever checking it out, without ever talking to a Palestinian. Even with all of that, the vast majority of these people, and if you speak to any of them, you will see, but you'd have to want to. You'd have to want to let go of your certainty that they're against you, that they're your enemy. And I promise you, I promise you and I implore you to consider that it's, it's, it's a lot nicer over here on this side of the river. When you get there, when you let go of that fear and that prejudice and that bigotry, that's what it is. I'm not making anyone wrong. It's a human thing. But when you can actually free your heart and your soul and your mind from those contortions and those constrictions and those constraints, you actually encounter a people who are full of love and who are, you know, actually capable also of, of, of even forgiveness, but not in some kind of beatific, saintly way where we don't owe them anything first. Justice, then peace. Accountability, then um, coexistence. Truth, then reconciliation. So as we bring this conversation to a close, what are you guys, what are we all, I don't know, I don't know how to say this, dreaming of, fighting for, looking towards, what, I mean, there's the immediate future, there's the midterm future, there's the long-term future. What is, what kind of possibilities are there that we can, um, that we can draw on and, and what do you want to see? What do you hope to see in terms of the way, because you said at the beginning, we want to have some kind of impact on the way this conversation is happening. So what do you see as the next shift that could or should happen? Well, in terms of the conversation, um, I believe that the answer out is in the truth. And that means in actually recognizing what actually has happened. Not what we wish had happened, or what we wish hadn't happened, but what has actually happened. And take from there, we're willing to go from what happened to a different kind of vision. Now, um, my hope is for from sea to sea, from, from, from the river to the sea, Palestine shall be free. And I mean free for everybody. And that doesn't mean free only for Palestinians or only for Jews, free for everybody. By the way, I don't just wish that for Palestine. I wish it for Canada as well. I wish it for the United States. From sea to shining sea, let these countries be free. That means that there should be no inequality. No discrimination, no racism, no um, control by a few people of all the resources while the earth is being destroyed. So the freedom is not a threatening concept. Freedom is not a threatening concept. I want there to be a land where people are not threatened with the loss of their villages and their livelihood where one people doesn't get to lord it over another, where people can actually live in equality. I wish I could say that I'd like to see two states, but there's no more room for two states. That's been destroyed by the Zionist project. On purpose. On purpose. And we keep talking about the Hamas charter and the, the New York Times, bless its soul, for years, Every time they mention Hamas, this is for years now, they would say, it's an organization that doesn't accept the right of the state of Israel to exist. And they couldn't mention the word Hamas without having to throw that phase in there. When they mentioned Likud, they didn't say the same thing, whereas they should have. They should have said, Likud is a party that doesn't accept the right of the Palestinian state to exist. That's in the Likud charter. It actually says from the river to the sea in their charter. Yeah, the, yeah, river to the sea, yeah. It will only be Jewish sovereignty. Yeah. That also yeah. rhymes. It's just not as catchy. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I just want justice and truth and fairness. I believe it's achievable, but it's not compatible with the Zionist project. And it's not compatible with the racist project that Zionism didn't intend to become in theory, but has become in practice because... If I and my two sons here got on a plane tomorrow and flew to, uh, flew to Tel Aviv 
and we could apply for citizenship the day after. And we were filming this on a Monday. By Friday, we could be living in a settlement in the West Bank as citizens of the state of Israel with full rights, which our Palestinians neighbors don't have. But that's a racist situation. If we have the right to return, so-called, after 2,000 years, not that I can prove that I came from there, why doesn't the Palestinian who still carries in his pocket the deed to his parents' home have the right to even talk about the right of return? So something has to be given up. Now, nobody's denying the Jewish pain, nobody's denying the Jewish trauma, nobody's denying the Jewish desperation for security, um, nobody's denying the suffering that was occur occurred on October the 7th, the difficulties that are going on now. But let's broaden the lens to look at everybody, to look at the whole picture. And the question is, can we be human beings here together? And I think we can. In the short term, what I want to see is continued activism for Palestine, especially in the U.S., where a policy shift could make all the difference. The support of the U.S. allows for Israel to continue its assault. And once it goes away, as Israeli leaders recognize, uh, Israel would be forced to stop. And um, politically, I actually haven't given up on the idea of two states, at least mm -hmm. as a temporary thing. I don't see any other solution, at least for now. And this is only my opinion here. I would like to see Israel rise to Hamas's level, where um, even if you don't want to accept the existence of a Palestinian state, if you're Israel, at least accept your own recognized borders. And Hamas has recognized the, the international community's conception of Palestinian borders, which is the West Bank and Gaza. Hamas has recognized that already. It's actually in its latest updated charter, completed a few years ago. Um, and I would like to see Israel meet that level too, accept its own internationally recognized borders rather than see itself as a state that has the right to take over and, uh, as much land <clears throat> as it wants. And once you have an actual two-state solution, not the Batustan solution of the Oslo peace year, but an actual two-state solution, maybe in future generations one day we can actually achieve what really is justice in Palestine, which is a freedom, equality for everybody in one state. But for now, as a temporary solution, I don't think we should give up on the idea of you know, two states because that is the global consensus and there's a legal basis for it. There's a legal basis for Israel within the pre-June 67 borders and there's a legal basis for Palestine and the West Bank and Gaza. And if Hamas is even willing to make the compromise of accepting just 22% of historic Palestine, which is what the West Bank and Gaza is, then Israel should be able to accept that compromise finally. Um, and that's what I think where, again, U.S. support, U.S. leverage is instrumental. If the U.S. wanted that policy, I think it actually could become possible. Well, first, so that I don't subsume it under my um, sort of pile of wishes for, for Jewish people, I wish for Palestinian empowerment. I wish for Palestinian voices to matter more in our world, to be lended credence on their own terms, not uh, because they have the right talking points or whatever, but I want people to know what Palestinians have experienced. And I want us to, um, you know, I was going to say humanize Palestinians, but it's a terrible phrase yeah, because it suggests that they weren't to begin with. I actually mean humanize ourselves by becoming more, um, perceptive and aware of the humanity of others. Yeah. Uh, which would then allow more of a space for Palestinians to speak without being grilled on, do you condemn Hamas? You know, which I remember Christiana Mampur on October 8th was doing with her Arab guest. And it, that's what prompted me to first go on Instagram and start talking about this stuff. Um, obviously, everything you said, Aaron, in terms of freedom for Palestine and an end to this horrific crime. But in terms of the conversation, um, I want to say this in as lighthearted and loving a way as I can, but I also want to be rigorous about it and just say what's on my heart. I want to see the mainstream Jewish community grow up already. And I, ju I just, I mean that lovingly, you know, and I would say it to a cousin or a friend or a 
sibling or parent, you know, or to myself. I know what it is to get caught in stories about my own limitations and my victimization and how everyone's against me and all the reasons for why I do the things I do and all the reasons why things can't change. And if only they would change, then I'd be able to change. I know what that's like. I know the energy of that. It sucks. And I mean, it sucks actually quite literally. It sucks my energy. It sucks my vitality. It drags me down. And that's how I see certainly our unelected leaders in the, in big parts of the Jewish community behaving and having an influence on many other well-intentioned, otherwise progressive people, a kind of self-absorbed, um, almost trauma-addicted, which is a touchy thing to say, but I'll say it, uh, way of operating that can border on or even tip into narcissism, where our own fear and insecurity and trauma and our subjective view has to dominate everyone else's. And I just don't think that's a good way to live. I don't think that's a good use of our time on this planet. I don't think it's at all um, a continuation or honoring of what our ancestors taught us what our teachings, our scriptures, whatever part of Judaism you identify with. I'm, you know, I've always been more on the side of a secular Jew, but fine, the the Jewish artists and intellectuals and thinkers and philosophers, you know. And then there's the religious side of things. So I I would want us to to disidentify from these pollutions of who we are and get back to a kind of Judaism that makes us at home in the world by virtue of being human. There's a spiritual that you said that um, security is always on the side of truth. So you can have a false sense of security but identifying with certain things but not real security. And what's happening right now, um, I guarantee I won't be on to see it. But historically, it'll be seen as one of the greatest disasters in Jewish history. And I'm not talking about what's being done to us. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about what we're doing to others. We're undermining who we are. That state cannot sustain its dominance over the Middle East. The American Empire will not last forever. No empire ever does. And... If you come from nothing else but the well-being and survival of the Jewish people, which I don't identify with that as sort of the only worthy goal supporting or, or fighting for or living for, but if that's all you come from, even from that point of view, you may not realize it, but by supporting what's going on right now, you're undermining your own future. And ultimately, you know, we're all human beings. And um, the past, and we have, you know, the Israelis have created a culture. They're not going to go back to Europe or wherever they came from. It, you know, in, in many ways, Israel is a remarkable achievement. I mean, these people did come. They created a new language out of the old one. The culture, art, music, um, amazing technological, achieve technological achievements, a sense of community and all that, you know. Um, that can be acknowledged. Um, but it did come at a terrific cost to somebody else. And that cost is still being imposed. And ultimately, whatever good has been created will not sustain itself. So again, real security is only in the truth. 